do you guys know like how spoiled we are that we have a worship team like this? Do you know? Sometimes, sometimes I wish you would go to another church, not forever, but just a little bit to just to see what it's like in most of the other churches. Hey, so I know this is weird and there's someone out here. Can someone turn off the airplane that's, that's trying to take off right here for me? Thank you. Um, hey, while they're doing that online tribe, good to see you guys. Hi, mom. Happy you're here. Um, my mom's watching online. She's my most, most faithful watching person. Hey, I have a real quick, just a, a question for you guys. I asked first service, it was overwhelming. So I'm gonna add some options here. Did you know it's, it's the two year anniversary almost of, of two weeks to flatten the curve? Congratulations. Um, I think it has flattened. Um, so I went in a couple times to do a handshake this morning and people hit me with the fist bump. So I just wanna know like where we're all at now that it's 2022, but I'm gonna add some options. So um, how many of you are still like the hand shakers? You wanna shake hands? Okay, yeah, so first service. So how many of you are the fist bumps? Fist bumps. Okay, question. How many of you are huggers? Yeah. Oh my gosh, how did that happen? Okay. Fellow introverts. How many of you wave at me from a couple of feet away? No? Okay, what? You don't even bother to raise your hand. See, that's how we are as introverts. We're like, you know who we are. We don't have to raise our hand. We're not going to do that. Um, it's just interesting the way our interactions have changed. All right, so today... Uh, I can't believe there's that many huggers in the church. That actually does throw me off a little bit. I don't hug anyone. Now I'm realizing you must get, like, think I don't like you all. I, I still love you from a distance. It's okay. I don't care about the virus. I just don't like close contact with other people. Um, all right, we're going to do something a little different today. Uh, we are going to look at just one verse. Just one. Just a little different than what I normally do. Um, this, it's the most controversial verse in the book of Jonah. Uh, it's also the verse that makes the story famous. It's the, the, the verse in this story. Uh, and there are implications built into this verse. Like how you think about this verse ripples into how you think about a lot of other verses in the Bible. How you think about this verse will ripple into like how you think about your life. And most importantly, how you think about this verse will ripple into how you think about God and how he works in the world. So uh, if this is your first time here, let me just kind of catch you up. We're in a story about a guy uh, named Jonah. And yes, it's that guy. This is the story of Jonah and the whale. Um, so God told him to go in one direction. He chooses to go in the opposite. He ends up in a boat in a storm. His solution is to be thrown overboard. He says, that's what's going to calm the storm. And it does. Uh, so we looked at that part of the story uh, last week. And we kind of left it in a cliffhanger. You know, Jonah hits the water and then we just, you know, fade to black. That was it. Uh, if it was a sitcom, you would have been frustrated because you would want to know what's going to happen. But since you probably already know the story, you knew uh, what comes after he hits the water. But I do want to just kind of imagine the story with me. Like the, soul, or the, the sailors are on this boat and they're like, kind of a little nervous to throw him in. You know, they go one, two, and then they throw him in. And then the storm really does calm and they, at first they're like super grateful, but you know, there had to have been a moment in there somewhere where they're like, wait a minute, where'd that guy go? <laughs> right? <laughs> like we just threw him in. They're like looking over the edge. Like what happened to the guy? The storm is calm now. You probably could find him. And then they just see this big thing move through the water <laughs> next to them. They're like, oh, that's what happened to him. So uh, that's where we're picking up the story in Jonah chapter one, verse 17 the only verse we're going to look at in this story today. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. So Jonah hits the water. He evidently sinks like a rock, and he is swallowed by a really big fish. And this verse says that he stayed in that fish for three days and for three nights. Now, I want to make an observation, an initial observation about this verse, that if you grew up in church, if you've been a Christian a long time, you might not like make this observation. But if you're newer to church, maybe not a Christian, this is like the observation you'll make about this verse. Here it is, just three words. That is impossible. That is impossible. So, uh, it, 
If you're a Christian, you're like, what do you mean? Like, we, we got to acknowledge this, Christians. Like, we say stuff like, hey, Jesus' mom was a virgin. And we're just like, whatever. <laughs> and like, people in the, you know, a normal person walking down the street be like, hold up, what now? <laughs> she, she was a what? Are you sure? Like, um, did she just say that? Or was that really true? Like, right? Like, this would be a conversation. And the, the, so to say that a dude got swallowed by uh, a whale and stayed inside that, the belly of that thing for three days, like, that's, that's impossible, this is a huge, huge deal. And by the way, it's not even just that it's a whale. Actually, the Hebrew word for fish is dag. The Hebrew word for whale is tenin. And Jonah uses the word dag here. And so he's actually saying it's not a whale, which maybe would be easier to believe because you're like thinking Dory, right? <laughs> and, 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 and finding Nemo, you're like, oh yeah, there's room in there. But no, he, he says it's a, it's a great fish. It's impossible. So what do we do with that? I mean, just imagine this with me. Whatever this fish looked like swallowed him up and he is now inside the belly of this thing somehow with a little air pocket that lasts for three days and, and he somehow doesn't get digested and then somehow this fish eventually will spit him out exactly where God wanted it to happen. That, that's impossible. What do we do with stuff like this? Because this is not the only place in the Bible that something like this happens, right? There are a lot of things. The Bible is full of impossible things happening. The Bible is full of that. Let me, I'm just give you a quick rundown. This isn't an exhaustive list, but let me just read a couple of these things to give you a feel for how much uh, miraculous is in the Bible. Genesis chapter seven, there's a worldwide flood. Genesis 21, a 90 year old woman gives birth to a child. That's more miraculous than a virgin birth right there, right? Um, Exodus chapter three, Moses has an encounter with a bush that is on fire, but does not burn up. Exodus 11 through, or seven through 11, 10 plagues ravage Egypt and they let Israel go. And those 10 plagues happened like on demand uh, when Moses said for them to happen. Uh, Exodus 14, the Red Sea splits down the middle and the people of Israel walk through on dry ground and then it perfectly closes back up when the Egyptian army walks through. Exodus chapter 16, uh, this stuff called manna falls from heaven and it feeds an entire nation of people while they wander around a desert. Numbers 22, a donkey speaks like a human. I was going to make like a politician joke, but... You can just imagine. It's not even, oh, I didn't mean it like that. So you think I meant donkey. I meant the other word. Never mind. Thank you. Okay, you're getting it. You're getting it. I wasn't talking about a certain political party. Anyways, Joshua chapter six, the walls of Jericho fall down after the Israelites just walk around them. No trebuchets, no battering rams. They just walk around the, and the walls fall down. Joshua chapter 10, the sun stands still in the sky, which we know means that the earth stopped rotating and nobody flew off. That's pretty surprising. First Kings 17, Elijah raises a widow's son from the dead. One chapter later, he calls fire down from heaven to engulf a sacrifice. Daniel chapter two, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survive being thrown into a fiery furnace, which the people throwing them in got burned up by. Uh, Daniel chapter six, Daniel survives being thrown into a den full of hungry lions for an entire night. And that's just the Old Testament. And that is not an exhaustive list. Like I said, if you just jump to Jesus' life, right? Jesus' mom is a virgin. That's pretty surprising, right? He heals blind people, deaf people, lame people, like, like a lot. Uh, he feeds 5,000 people with a loaf of wonder bread and a couple of fish sticks, right? Like he does whatever he wants. He walks on water. He tells a thunderstorm to shut up and it listens. And oh yeah, uh, he was dead for three days and came back to life. That's the big one. Slightly better clap than first service. They still kind of a golf clap. You guys need to work on that. Um, the Bible's full of impossible things happening. The Bible is full of impossible things happen. And this is called the miraculous, right? So I want to talk about miracles today. The Bible's full of them. Uh, and just so we're on the same page, let me define what I mean when I say the word miracle. Uh, a miracle is something that happens outside of the natural order of things, right? There are laws, there are patterns in nature which can be predicted and reproduced. And a miracle is something that happens outside of those, that breaks that pattern, that breaks those laws. The Bible is full of those kind of events. 
What are we going to do with that? You have to decide and you're, you can't like not have an opinion about that. You have to decide what you're mentally going to do with all these things in the Bible that happen that are impossible. I'll give you four options. You can make up your own if you want, but here's, here's four ways you could go. Number one, uh, some people, when they read the impossible in the Bible, when they read the miraculous in the Bible, they, uh, they do what's called, they, they allegorize it. Um, so it, it's supposed to like mean something else than what is actually said. So when Jonah said, hey, I was in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights, what he meant was he had a really hard time for a couple of days, right? Like it was, it was a dark place. Not necessarily a belly of a fish, but you know, a dark place or something like that. Some scholars, they, they do stuff with it. They kind of dance a little bit. Um, some speculate that he floated on top of a dead fish's belly, like floating through the water. So it was kind of like being in the belly of a whale, but it wasn't really. Um, others say that he, <laughs> he got picked up by a boat named Great Fish. That's possible, right? <laughs> so like he didn't mean an actual fish, it was a boat. Um, so they try to find a way to make it not mean what it says, okay? But it's supposed to point towards a deeper meaning. That's, that would be one option. Uh, another option is that people try to find a scientific way to actually prove that it is possible. So they're starting to look up fish, like big fish. They Google big fish and they're like, which one could have done this, right? And they're really trying to find it. Someone's like, oh, I read an article a couple years ago that a scuba diver got swallowed up. Uh-huh, okay, cool. He had, a, he had an oxygen tank and he was in there for five seconds. It was different. Um, but you're trying to find a scientific way to make, like, make you be able to believe that these things happen. That's another route you can go. And when I was younger, that was all the rage, man, trying to find scientific ways to prove that these things could have happened. The third thing you can do with the miraculous in the Bible is you can just use it as a reason not to believe it. I think a lot of people do that, right? They read stories like this. Oh, Jonah was in a, in a fish for three days and three nights. Yeah, that's not true. That never happened. Probably the rest of the story didn't happen. This whole thing maybe is made up. You can use it as a reason to kind of push away from the whole thing. And then the fourth way you could do, you can look at this, is that the miraculous in the Bible is miraculous. Uh, that these things happened exactly the way they're recorded, and they are outside of the natural order of things. So... Those are kind of four ways you can like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend the rest of my time arguing for number four, that the miraculous in the Bible is miraculous. And by the way, you should know that. I'm a pastor. You knew I was going to go with that one, right? Did somebody get nervous? Like, is he going to allegorize this thing? Oh my gosh. Like, I'm in the wrong church. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going I'm to go with number four, that the miraculous is the miraculous, okay? Um, so, and... Uh, what, what I mean is, is the supernatural. I'm arguing for the supernatural. I'm arguing for miracles that actually really did happen. Um, I'm arguing that God made it. In this story, he made a fish that was big enough to swallow Jonah. I don't know what that was like. That he told this fish to swallow Jonah and the fish listened. And that somehow he supplied Jonah with oxygen for three days and three nights, and that somehow he prevented Jonah from being digested, which I know is a gross thought, but somehow he prevented him from, from just disappearing in there. And he told the fish where to spit him up, and that God did all that in the story, miraculously. So I'm going to argue for that today. Now, um, I think I've told you before, some of the time, like when I'm preparing a sermon, what I do is I imagine like talking to somebody about it, um, and since I'm, you can ask my wife, I kind of like to fight. So I imagine you being like hostile towards this idea and me wanting to convince you of it. So I'm going to fight against you today, uh, whether you agree with me or not. I'm just going to ask my wife. It's fun. I do this all the time. We weren't arguing. Now we are because I've just decided we're going to argue about it. And I need, I need to push up against something here. So here's what I'm imagining you, uh, like your position. Um, I want, I'm going to think of you as a person who just assumes that the miraculous is, is not something that happens. That you're, you're somebody who does not believe that the miraculous is, is even a possibility, okay? So I'm, I'm looking at you like that, and I'm going to talk to you as if that's true, even if it's not, even if it's probably not, because most of you probably don't think that way, but some of you might. Um, so just go along with me today. Entertain, just indulge me. All right. So it's kind of three parts to this. The first thing I want to talk to you about, if you don't believe in the miraculous, is your assumption, Okay. Your assumptions are really important in life. Like what you believe going into a subject is going to actually change how you deal with the subject. So your assumption is really important when we talk about the miraculous, okay? So here's my, my logic. Um, if you have the assumption that you 
that the miraculous is not a thing that happens, but is outside of the possibility of what you will experience. Um, if, if that's you, and then on top of that, you probably think that people do believe the miraculous are kind of primitive and kind of maybe stupid, right? Like you wouldn't say that, <laughs> but you would think like, okay, I'm like actually use my brain and I like actually went to school <laughs> and you guys probably didn't or you went to a bad school. Um, so if, if that's you um, and you have this assumption that, that the miraculous does not happen, what I want you to know then is that nothing you experience will you ever be able to consider miraculous. I know this is kind of weird at first because when I say that, you're like, well, yeah, duh, because there is no such thing as miraculous. But hold on a second. If you are true to the assumption, nothing you experience will you ever be able to consider miraculous, even if the most likely explanation is miraculous. Um, so let me give you an, an example. Let's just say one day you're walking down the street and you look up and the sky cracks open and the clouds roll back and there is God on his high throne in heaven. And he bends down and he goes, yo, I'm real. And then just fades back and the crowds roll back. And you're standing there like, what? Now, listen, if you have the assumption that the miraculous does not happen, what are you going to do with that? Get a CAT scan? For real though, you have to, right? If the miraculous doesn't happen, what was that? Did I hit my head earlier? Did somebody slip me a roofie or something? Like, what is going on? Or, or is this like that Spider-Man? Is it, was it Spider-Man Far From Home where there's like the illusion, like somebody's got some drones or something creating a holograms, a really sophisticated prank somebody played on me. The only thing you can't do is believe that it actually happened, right? Now, if that's you, you're like, yeah, who cares? Because it's not going to happen. I, but what I want to get you to see is that your assumption is a dangerous one because you've already decided what you're going to experience. You're going to have to dance and twist and turn to make it fit what you've already decided. And this is really important. This is really important because that's actually bad science. Did you know that? So I was a biology major, did the whole scientific method thing. Your assumptions going into like an experiment are really important. So if you assume ahead of time that one outcome isn't possible, you're actually not doing good science. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to say, hey, I'm open to any possibility except for that one. That's not good science. You're supposed to come in open to the possibilities and allow the data to tell you what is true. So I guess this, this first little argument that I have here is if you really want to like be objective in this, to, to, to think about this the right way, you should at least open yourself up to the possibility of the miraculous happening. That's my first argument. It's kind of a simple one. And some of you, I know if you're a Christian, you're like, yeah, okay, cool, man. <laughs> we're, we're well past that. But just, this is important. For some people, they're not there yet. And they don't, they're, they're still in the, um, the miraculous can't possibly happen. So let me, give you, let me give you a Bible example. Let me give you a Bible example. Um... Bible story happens in 2 Kings 19. It's actually about this King, King Sennacherib of Assyria. Interestingly enough, Assyria is the nation that Jonah's going to preach to. So there's a little connection here. This is a couple hundred years later, and now they're attacking Jerusalem. <laughs> Maybe Jonah was onto something here. Um, so they, did, they, they do end up repenting, but evidently they go back to being um, not kind to Israel. So they are attacking Jerusalem, and Assyria is at this time the most powerful military force on the planet, okay? Uh, so they march on Jerusalem, uh, and here's what happens, Second Kings 19, verses 35 and 36. That night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land, he went home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. I love how like unassuming. He's like, yeah, we're going home, guys. We're, <laughs> there's there's 200,000 dead guys. We're, we're out of here. Um, it just says it so like calm. Like, yeah, he broke camp and went home. Uh, that's, that's bad. Now, here's the interesting part. This is why I bring this story up. Uh, historians, not Christian historians, just you know, the regular kind, um, confirm that Sennacherib did attack Jerusalem during this time, that he did not succeed, and that he went home. Historians agree about all of that. There's one part of these two verses that they disagree with. Do you know which part? It's that whole angel thing, right? That's the part they don't agree with. But here's the account that they do believe. 
There's a historian that writes that Sennacherib did turn around. He did go home. The reason, let me read it. The Assyrian army turned around because field mice came and ate their bowstrings. (laughs) That's what it says. And they went home because they didn't have any bows and arrows anymore. The most powerful nation, or the most powerful army in the most powerful nation turned around and didn't attack Jerusalem because of Mickey Mouse. That's why. <laughs> and um, I, listen, I'll mock it. And I like, for real though, it, what I'm, what I, and this isn't, it's, I don't want to build a straw man. I love, I like to do it, but I don't want to do it. So if, if this is you and you're like, hey, I don't believe the miraculous. You're telling me an angel killed 200,000 guys. A historian saying some field mice ate some bowstrings. Maybe you'll still lean that way. I guess what I want to, to point you towards though, is like, if you didn't have a bias, towards the non-miraculous, which one's more likely? It's all I want to say. Like, if you didn't have the bias, you didn't say, hey, I don't believe the miraculous is possible, so it must be the field mice. But if you, if you could take that bias away, which one is more likely to be true? Mouse? Angel? I want to say, I think if you could eliminate the bias, maybe... Um, It's just weird because we don't think... We think about the miraculous so much different than we do anything else, right? Like, so... Man, I was watching so many things this, this week about how we view eyewitness accounts, right? So like if, if somebody sees a car wreck, we like actually kind of trust what they say. Like, hey, that guy hit that guy, right? Like we trust it. But when somebody says, hey, this miraculous thing happens to me, our default is, yeah, right, dude, right? <laughs> like, um, and I get it. Um, and I'm not saying that all the people who say the miraculous has happened, like that they're, a lot of them are crazy. Um, but maybe we shouldn't just dismiss all of them just because we think, a couple of people are crazy. And maybe we shouldn't say we're so confident that field mice could turn around the most powerful army in the world when maybe there was something else going on there. So that's my first little argument. It's, it's an argument about your assumption. I just very simply in this first one want to, to just ask if you could tick one degree and say, I'm open to the possibility of the miraculous. Even if I never really think I'm going to experience, I'm open to the possibility. I'm not closing the door on that. That's really just my first argument. All right, so second, second one. Um, I think the second thing that kind of pops up is this idea that there's this big distinction between science and belief in God, right? Like these two things have to be so different that there's this big chasm between what science knows and what Christianity believes, and they're so far apart. Um, And it almost feels, especially, man, like... Uh, you know, I, I did the whole college thing. I did the whole grad school thing. You get into those higher learning things. And they almost like mock you for having belief in something like, okay, you're an idiot. If you just learn a little bit more, you know, you'd think like we do. Um, so they kind of create this. And I guess that's a, my first observation is I don't think we're as far apart as, as it's, it's presented. That Christianity believing things and science knowing things. I don't think they're as far apart as, as people want it to seem. Um, but secondly... I say this really carefully. I know somebody's going to take this out of context. You're not allowed to cut this. If you're watching online, you're not allowed to take this snippet and and put it on its own. It needs the whole context. How dare you try to edit my sermon? Stop it. All right, here's the sentence. You ready? Science has its limits. Don't hold your rocks for a minute. Science has its limits. Science can only know uh, what it can observe and test. I did this first. I don't know why I'm talking about science like it's a person. Scientists, right? They're humans. They're not God. Like it's not, it's not capital S. Scientists can only know what they uh, observe and test. You have to be able to like observe it and you have to be able to test it to be able to know it. So here's my example. And forgive me, this is a little heady. So if you loved like science and biology, and, and you, you're going to love this. If you didn't, I had somebody first service go, yeah, my head hurts a little bit. I'm like, I'm sorry, Carol. Um, she, didn't, she didn't like it. Um, she still told me it was a good sermon, though, because she's a sweetheart. And she likes me. People pat me on the head and be like, that was really good. I didn't understand anything you said, but that was good. I actually, come to think of it, I've never had anybody tell me I'd, I preach bad. What does that mean? Is that, remember, remember, Mike, I just always talk to you now. You're just sitting right there. You're just going to be, remember when we arm wrestled a couple, like, like a year ago and you pretended to lose? I just want to publicly call Mike out for pretending to lose. I know I did not win that fair. 
somebody told you let pastor win because his ego or something, I don't know, but you let me win that. I'm just calling you out publicly right now for throwing the fight. Um, I'm trying to like get you to laugh before we do the heady thing. I don't know if you can tell. I'm like nervous to do this science thing. All right, you ready? Here we go. For the longest time, scientists, um, well, I'm going to say believed, but they would say knew. They knew. Scientists knew that the universe did not have a beginning. Now, that's a weird thing to think about, but, but um, for a long time, many, many decades, they believed that the universe just, if you look backwards, it just went on forever. And it kind of has always existed. Really long time, they knew that. Up until kind of recently, um, when they've done some math, they've made some observations, and they've come to the conclusion that, wait a minute, actually the universe does have a beginning. There was a point where all this stuff kind of converges, and that is the beginning, okay? Now, that's a huge deal. Because what that means is that science and Christianity actually agree on something there, right? That there was a beginning. <laughs> Ours is in Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning. So we believe that. And scientists would say, hey, the, the first like, couple words of the Bible, we agree with that too. In the beginning, there was a beginning. I know I'm harping on that. So that's a really big deal. Now, um, I don't mean to be mean about scientists, but you know, they always would say like, hey, we're just reporting the data, da 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 um, But some of them, I'll be honest, they like weren't happy about the discovery because it puts it too close to what Christianity believes. So it's kind of a little iffy for them. Um, and there was this very same famous scientist named Stephen Hawking. You probably heard of him. Um, he kind of got, I'll say, accused of being sympathetic to Christians, <laughs> which is an insult in the scientific community. Um, so he released a statement clarifying his position. Two things you need to know to be able to begin to understand what he says here. Um, I'm not going to read you the whole thing because I don't understand any. It's just a little tiny piece that I can kind of understand. Um, one is that when they say the universe had a beginning, um, you know, they would call it the Big Bang. That at this point, um, space and, and time itself began. And that's super weird to think about. What their argument is that time did not exist before this thing happened. And I don't know about you, but my brain hurts a little bit to try and imagine no time. But they're saying that time itself and space itself expanded out from this moment. Um, the other thing you need to know, and this is like third grade science, um, is that everything that has uh, the cause and effect, right? Everything has a cause, right? In science, remember that, that there's cause and effect. There's always going to be a cause. There's, there, it, it always works that way. Okay, so those are the two things you need to know to understand this quote. This is Stephen Hawking defending himself against people who are accusing him of being sympathetic to a creator. Here's what he says. We have finally found something that does not have a cause because there was no time for a cause to exist in. For me, this means there is no possibility of a creator because there's no time for a creator to have existed. Since time itself began at the moment of the Big Bang, it was an event that could not have been caused or created by anyone or anything. So when people ask me if God created the universe, I tell them the question itself makes no sense. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang, so there's no time for God to make the universe in. All right. Now, I don't know if the problem jumps out at you, um, but, but let me explain. So if everything has a cause, everything has a cause in the universe, scientifically speaking, everything. He is saying in this paragraph that he has found one exception to that rule. Just one. The entire universe. <laughs> That's the only exception to this rule. Everything else is we test and observe and repeat. Like it's cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect. Except the entire universe. That, that's the one thing that this does not apply to, okay? I just want to say that's a pretty convenient stance to take, uh, but that's what he's saying here. And he's also saying, like his big argument is that before this point, wherever this point was, before that, there was nothing, no time for God to have done the thing, right? That's what he's saying. Like there's no time that God could have done this thing that would have made it explode into any, because there's no time. I want to point out that if there was no time for God to do it, is there any time for anything to have done it? Right? So can I read this again? And I'm just going to replace any time he says God or creator, I want to, I want to replace it with, with the term scientific process because that's something that, that, that he would believe in. Uh, let me read it and, and just tell me if, the, if this changes things for you. 
Uh, we have finally found something that does not have a cause because there's no time for a cause to exist. And for this means there's no possibility of a scientific process because there's no time for a scientific process to have existed. Since time itself began at the moment of the Big Bang is an event that could not have been caused or created by anyone or anything. So when people ask me if a scientific process created the universe, I tell them that question itself doesn't make sense. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang, so there's no time for scientific process to make the universe in. Uh-oh, Stephen. Um, the same sword you're using to attack a creator kind of also works against anything else that could have brought rise to the universe, right? It, it eliminates any possibility of the... And, and guys, I don't know if... It, the universe exists. <laughs> We're in it right now. <laughs> so any, this, this paragraph kind of just almost eliminates the possibility of a universe, but I, I just want to say I'm living in it so I know that it exists. Something brought it into existence. But what I want you to see, it's, it's more of a logic thing for me. Science would say, if you can't test or observe something, you can't know it. And he just said he knew something, didn't he? There's no time for a creator to have existed. Really, Stephen, you can't go past that point. That point is a barrier that you cannot go backwards past this point where they say the universe began. They can't get through there. There's no time for, for them to get through there. But he is making a statement about the other side of this beginning. That is not a scientific statement. That is a statement of belief. He is not telling you he knows something. He's telling you he believes something, right? That's a big deal. So again, I'm actually, I, I would even have this argument with him where I know what I just said doesn't mean that God exists. It just means that you don't know that he doesn't, buddy. And you can't say that. You can't say that because it, it, if God didn't create the universe, then, then how did it happen? How did it spring into existence? Um, if there was no time for God, there's no time for anything else. What his choice here in this little paragraph really is, it's not a choice between knowing and believing. It's a choice between believing and believing, right? You believe in, well, I guess nothing, or you believe in God. That's kind of what he's saying here. Which leads me to um, a quote by my favorite author, C.S. Lewis. He says this, you can't know. You can only believe or not. You can't know. You can only believe or not. So uh, my first argument was kind of against the assumption that the miraculous can't happen. My second one here is just to say that like this idea that you can like know these cosmic huge things, I don't think that's, that's a possibility for us. I think we have to choose to believe something. That, that being a science person doesn't put you in some other category, um, some safe category. And like us Christians, we take some big risk in believing something. I think it's all risky, guys. It's all risky. You're either choosing to believe that, that some scientific process created the universe or you're choosing to believe that a creator did. You got to choose to believe something. You can't know. You can't. And I think that's because God created it that way. That's <laughs> my bias coming out, I know. Um, but I think God created the universe in this way on purpose. All right. We're done with science time. You're welcome. You got through it. Um, I want to I wanna get to the third thing here. Um, I want to ask a question about the miraculous. And I'll come back to Christianity here. And it's a big one. It's a question that... You know, maybe if you're newer to the faith and you're, or, or maybe you're just kind of kicking the tires, kind of testing things out here and you're, you're not sure about this whole thing. It might be a question that you might ask as you're starting into a, a journey towards faith, maybe, um, at least considering it. So um, the question is, can we have Christianity without the miraculous? Can, can I have Christianity without the miracles, can I take maybe the good advice of the Bible, the moralism, the guidelines for living, and just kind of leave out the big fish, you know, like, I, can, I, can I just, I, I get the, hey, maybe there's some good lessons in the story of Jonah, but I don't want to have to believe in the miraculous. You might be familiar, Thomas Jefferson actually took scissors to his Bible and cut out all the miracles because that's what he wanted. He wanted uh, the moral compass of the Bible without uh, the miracles. So good, good question. Um, I would say you, you could, but there is a major problem with that. Um, if you cut the miraculous out of the Bible, you cut out the parts that make it Christian. 
You cut out the parts that make a Christian. This is really important. You cut the miracles out of the Bible. You cut out the parts that make, make a Christian. Let me, let me unpack that for you. Um, all the other religions of the world teach that you have to work your way to whatever God they, they believe in, right? They all have some kind of path, some kind of list, some kind of a journey that they need to take to make it to their God. Christianity is the exact opposite of that. Christianity is the story about how God, instead of waiting on us to try and work our way to him, which is impossible by the way, he came down to us. Christianity is not about how we work our way to God, but how God came down to us. He knew that in our sin, we would never be able to get to him. So God became man, Jesus. He added to his divinity, humanity. He lived among us. He lives this perfect life, the life we were supposed to live. And then he dies on the cross, the death we were supposed to die. God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross that was supposed to be poured out on us. And then this is really important, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin, Satan, death, demons, and hell. Christianity is about believing in a God who came down and provided a way for us to get to him. And that way is in Jesus. Life, death, and resurrection. If you take that out, it's not Christian anymore. (laughs) It's something else. That is the essence of Christianity. You can't remove it. It'd be like taking the hydrogen atom out of a water molecule. You just, you just got air after that. You, you cannot take it out. To be a Christian, you truly do have to believe in the miraculous, at least in that transaction that took place on the cross. So here's my question. If you are a Christian and you're like, you know what? I do believe that God came down. I believe Jesus is not just a man, that he was the God man. That, and that I, I believe that he died on the cross for me. And I believe that he did actually come back to life three days after being dead. If that's you, I just want to say like, if you believe that is kind of the anchor point, why is it a stretch to believe the other ones? Right, if, uh, because death is our greatest enemy. I mean, guys, can you just for imagine, just think about death and how wild it is that at some point it all fades to black. Like that's why none of us get out w- without experiencing that, right? Like that's a crazy thing that this is a common human experience that we all die. That's wild. My brain like fizzles out when I try to think about it. But the if we believe that Jesus conquered that thing that none of us can conquer, that he walked out of grave, that his heart was stopped and dead and that it started pumping again and that he pushes the stone out of the way and walks out and and breathes air again. If we believe that he did that, is it such a stretch that God told some lions not to eat a dude? (laughs) Is it such a stretch that three guys walked around a furnace and God somehow made it so they didn't burn up? Is it such a stretch that God told uh, the Red Sea to just get out of the way and let the people of Israel walk through it? Is it it such a stretch that God could tell some, some walls of a city to just fall down because they obeyed him walking around it? Is it such a stretch that God could take a fish and make it so that he could swallow a guy for three days and keep him in there? Is it? If we believe that Jesus came back to life, do... I don't know, for me, that's the king miracle. And all the other ones are lesser. If he can do that, he can do anything. So I believe in the miraculous. Because all these these laws that we're talking about, these scientific laws of nature, we believe in the God who we also believe, like, um, he wrote them. Right? He wrote those laws. So like, is it such a stretch to believe the God who who told the earth to start spinning and it's been doing that for however long you believe it's been doing that, I'll just say it that way. Is it such a stretch for him to tell it to stop for a minute? Which one's miraculous to me? That it's spun perfectly for as many years as it's been spinning or that he can tell it to stop? 
for me, they're both miraculous. The fact that it's happening at all is crazy. But the creator, um, he spoke this thing into existence. So when he speaks again, he can bend it to his will. That's, that's a great verse in Psalms. The Lord is in the heavens. He does whatever he wants. If he wants to tell lions to stop, if he wants to tell thunderstorms to stop, he can do any of that. He can do the impossible because that, that word doesn't work for him. <laughs> That, that word impossible is not really in his dictionary. He does whatever he wants. This is where this whole thing leads to for me. Um, I don't want, I, I want to kind of push you away from being a Christian who would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in all that weird, crazy stuff. Like, okay, you got to at least believe in one crazy thing <laughs> to be a Christian. And if we're going to believe in one, we might as well lean into the rest of them is my argument. But I don't want you to be a Christian who doesn't believe that God can't do the impossible. I don't want you to be a Christian who pushes away from all of these stories because you're like embarrassed by them or afraid of them. What I really want is a church full of people who confidently, firmly, passionately believe that our God can do whatever he wants. And this is really important. This is really important because this is where I want to step into. Usually I, I mean, <laughs> sermons like this, I do struggle with these because like, usually I'm really heavy on like application. Like, what are you going to do with this in your life? And so far you're like, well, you told me a Stephen Hawking quote that I'm never going to remember, right? Like, I don't know what I, I'm going to have to like look that up and read it over lunch for somebody. Um, so here's the part that I, I want you to be able to like, the, the one thing I want you to go home with. God can do anything. And I feel like that's, I was just talking to somebody today, uh, this week about um, like faith and doubt and how like we always talk about those things like it's this super black and white, like either I'm here or I'm here, but it's, it's not that, is it? Faith and doubt is, man, I can be all over the sliding scale there. Really what I want to do is I just want to nudge you towards, towards faith today and believing that God can do anything. And that, like you have to take that and put that into your life. I don't know what you're going through today. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've got some adult kids who are, who are running away from God and they're, they're wayward and, and, and you kind of feel like it's impossible that they would ever come back to God. Maybe you've got a marriage that is dying or dead and it seems impossible for, for it to survive, let alone thrive. Maybe you've got some medical issue that doctors told you it's impossible. Maybe you've got some financial situation where the numbers are telling you it is impossible. Maybe your heart was broken by something that's happened in your life. For it to be healed, you feel like it would be impossible. Maybe you just feel lost and it feels like it would be impossible for you to find your way. If that's, I, I don't know what kind of situation you would find yourself in where you would feel like this is impossible. I just want to read a verse to you. Uh, in Matthew 19, 26. And Jesus, looking at them, said to them, with people, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. All things. I want to push you as far as I can into a default position that if God shows up, anything can change. That I want to push you into a position like the where your prayers kind of drip with the impossible. Like, wouldn't that make more sense if we really believe in a God who can do this with a fish, who can do this with the earth spinning, with 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 thunderstorms? That our that our prayers would kind of drip with the impossible. Wouldn't we bring those things to Him? Wouldn't we not have some weird line where like, well, God, this one's going to be a rough one for you. Like, God's in heaven going what? Like that's a pretty common refrain in the Old Testament, by the way, when uh, somebody is talking about a situation, God kind of leans in and goes, hey, um, is my arm, has my arm lost its power? God, it's, it's God literally flexing on people where he's like, hey, can you feel this for a minute and tell me, does it feel like it can handle that? Because God's like, hey, I can do anything. Why are you acting like this is going to be hard for me? It doesn't make any sense. You, all of your prayers should drip with the impossible because you believe in the creator who can do whatever he wants. Worship team, why don't you guys come up here? And that's what I want to challenge you with. What are your prayers like? Maybe right now, maybe right now you're facing something impossible. But I just want to say, man, according to Jesus, yeah, it's impossible with you. But if God shows up, man, that's different. So maybe right now, as they're singing the song, maybe you need to, to, to bring that thing before him. But 
And I'm not saying you haven't prayed about it yet, but maybe just that mentality, like I have this crazy confidence in this God who, who can do anything. And maybe you just lean into that a little bit more than you ever have before. That God, I'm struggling with this. I look at it, I know I can't do anything about it, but I know you can. Pray with me. Jesus, I believe. <laughs> I believe that you can do anything. I believe that you came back to life after being dead. I believe that that act saved me from my sin, gave me a relationship with God and a future home in heaven. I believe that, Lord. I also believe that you can step into this broken, sinful, fallen creation and give us little glimpses of heaven and do the impossible, Lord. So I pray for the person right now who's struggling to believe in that. But right now, they're even kind of warring in their own mind about the thing. Lord, I pray that they would lean into you. I pray that they would be like that father in that one story. I do believe, help my unbelief, Lord. I pray that they would, they would be in that place. Help me, Lord. I want to believe in a really big God. I want to pray really big prayers because I believe that. Help us as a church to lean into that. In Jesus' name. you leave, I want to make uh, an announcement that I'm just going to keep making because some of you like need, like you're like my children. I have to keep saying it over and over again. No offense. Um, we have currently 12 people signed up to get baptized. Clap for that. Better. Yes, that's exciting. Better than a golf clap. All right. That's really cool. But I still feel like there's some people who haven't, like you, you have decided to become a Christian. You put your faith in Jesus. You did all that, but you haven't been baptized yet. Um, I want to challenge you to just say yes to that. That that's just, it's just no being this thing. Oh, I don't know enough. Doesn't matter, dude. My favorite stories in Acts uh, where the Ethiopian's in the chariot and he like gets saved driving down the road. He's like, hey, there's a puddle. Should we do this? And Philip's like, yes, we're going to do this. You don't have to know nothing except Jesus saved you to get baptized. So man, if that's you, uh, there's sign-up sheets right back in the Welcome Center. If you have some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Most of them are going to be, yes, you should just do this. All right. Uh, we will see you guys next week. Have a good one.